this session will be recorded, uh, as you've heard from the message. Um, and this is the second uh, session of the Open Access Books Workouts. Um, uh, and uh, we've had a few weeks ago, uh, Janneke Adema as being the first. Uh, and I'm really happy to have uh, Lucy Montgomery um, in the call today, uh, talking about open knowledge institutions, reinventing universities, the book on the, and you see on the left side. Um, I will do a very short uh, introduction uh, to this uh, to this session. Um, and then we give the floor to uh, Lucy to talk about um, not so much the content of the book, which can of course be questioned and addressed also in this call, uh, but more we look and we dive into the, the, the how did it become uh, the book as it is um, we see on the on the screen and we have here uh, also in paper version. I don't know if that's visible. Um, so uh, and I will uh, start uh, after the talk by Lucy. I will start uh, with a few questions I I've had myself. Um, and uh, of course, this session is also um, uh, to learn. Um, so please, if you have any questions yourself to Lucy, uh, you're uh, invited to, uh, to address them uh, today. Um, that being said, um, so um, this is part of a, um, a series. Um, we have uh, five in total, you can see them on the right. Um, uh, short sessions about um, yeah, the practicalities on, on open access book uh, uh, publishing. Uh, from different angles and different perspectives. So looking at the infrastructure, for instance, or tools uh, or workflow processes um, and always open as as, uh, as um, main main goal. Um, this is part, this session, uh, the series is part of the Open Access Books Network. Um, and uh, it's a network we, um, uh, it's established on the Humanities Commons website. Um, and uh, in the call, uh, for instance, Agatha and Tom Mostert and Lucy uh, Barnes uh, are very active in organizing um, now, uh, that all the information is on the website uh, about open access books, um, but also organizing these events. So thank you for that uh, as well. Um, and you can find many discussions uh, on open access books in, in uh, looking at funding, for instance, practicalities, um, yeah, all aspects uh, regarding open access uh, book publishing uh, is addressed on this uh, on this network. A very helpful tool. Um, and going back one more one slide, um, just to mention. Um, so this will be an online session. We record it, but we also prepare uh, these written interviews. Uh, and uh, the one by Janneke Adema a few weeks ago uh, was just published um, during the Open Access Week. Uh, I think uh, two weeks ago um and um yeah so we address these questions the same sort of questions but also uh it offers um much more uh, uh linking to uh, for instance uh, other resources um uh, uh which were of interest uh of the for the project for instance um final remark um lucy is also in the editorial board as i am uh, of this uh, of this great toolkit uh, which I want to mention uh, because we are talking about um, uh, and the, the the process of of um, um, coming to a uh, to an open access book, and this toolkit is offering uh, great solutions. At least uh, and you can find many uh, questions, but also answers to, uh, for instance, this uh, the research cycle, the life cycle of a book. So how to um, uh, fund an, uh, your uh, your 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 book project. Um, but also the writing and submission procedures, peer review, had the quality aspect of open access books, um, and much, much more licensing, for instance. So it's a very helpful tool uh, to keep in mind if you want to publish in, in uh, an open access book. Um, and with that being said, um, I guess we now move to uh, Lucy to hear more about um, uh, the book project Open Knowledge Institutions. Um, and um, I guess we will hear something about uh, uh, how it is being um, uh, uh, produced, uh, I would say, um, to a final or at least a published version we see now at M MIT Press. Um, and uh, in this case, book sprinting was one of the 
um, uh, um, I guess uh, uh, processes they've uh, uh, they've engaged with uh, to to come to a final uh, to a final version of the book. Um, uh, yeah. So with that being said, uh, Lucy, um, I'm very grateful to have you here at the call, um, and maybe you can enlighten us um, about uh, your engagements with this uh, with this project, Open Knowledge Institutions, Reinventing uh, Universities. Oh, thanks, Jeroen. Okay, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Yeah, I will stop sharing. Oh, okay, so uh, is that working? Yeah. Yes, okay, all right, so thank you. Um, and I think this is currently my favourite series uh, of online conversations happening anywhere on the web. So it's really fun to be involved. And also I was saying uh, before we started that one of the benefits um, of COVID and all of the uh, sort of crash course that we've all taken in online collaboration and connecting and sharing has been uh, sort of the rise of events like this, which are really fantastic for people stuck in the wrong hemisphere. We're normally, uh, you know, a little bit locked out of some of the seminars and the networking and things that are really so lovely about living in places with bigger publishing industries and publishing sectors. So thank you for putting it on and thank you for recording it uh, and thinking about how you can be inclusive about how you share sort of these events and who you invite. So that's really good. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is I tuned in uh, to the video of uh, Agatha's, oh, sorry, Yannicka's talk last week. And I'm really pleased that I'm the second speaker, not the first speaker in this series, because uh, Yannicka's talk for me was a real reminder um, about how much my own experience of writing a book has changed between the first time I wrote a really traditional sole authored uh, closed monograph that was all about certification and a particular model of research and knowledge dissemination. Um, and the process that we went through to get to the publication of this book with MIT Press. Um, and actually often I think while we're experiencing big changes in technology and big changes in the possibilities of collaboration, it's easy to forget that actually the change is taking place because we're fish, you know, swimming in the water and we're not always seeing the water. But actually for me, um, my, my first book was published exactly, uh, well, we had the launch exactly 10 years ago today. Uh, and it feels really timely to be looking back and, and thinking about what's changed over those 10 years. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the contrast between my first writing and publishing experience and this experience. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> so the first book that I wrote and published was a fairly traditional humanities monograph. I did a PhD and that took me about four years. And then I spent two years more or less locked in a room, uh, turning my PhD into a book. And I did a bit of additional field work. I wanted an extra case study so that it was a nice, you know, round argument. I, you know, totally rewrote my PhD. I spent a lot of time in the British Library checking references. Um, and while I was writing up my book, I was invited to submit a book proposal to a publisher that uh, my PhD supervisor recommended to me as high quality and prestigious and uh, important in the field I was writing in. And those things were considered really, or sold to me as really important if I wanted to think about how my career would develop. And the purpose that I think my uh, supervisor had in mind in publishing a book with a particular kind of publisher was, he was concerned about uh, prestige and certification and how I would go on to get my next job. Um, and eventually after a couple of years of sweating away and agonizing about my commas and full stops, <laughs> uh, there was a book launch. We all drank some wine. Everyone said some nice things. Uh, and that was it. You know, that was, the book was out. Uh, my baby had grown up and left home. 
Uh, I had a PhD. I had a book that proved I was a real academic. Um, and it was an end point in a research process. It wasn't the beginning of something. It was the end of something. Um, and actually, I felt a huge sense of relief when that book was published because it meant that I could send my ideas away um, and I could let other people engage with my work without me necessarily having to be uh, still engaged with that project and with those ideas, I could sort of consign my thoughts to some process of history where other PhD students would be able to come along and to make their own judgment about whether my scholarship was valuable or not valuable. Um, but that could happen at some kind of distance from me. Um, and I could then think about what I wanted to do next instead of what I'd sort of, you know, the project that you're so sick of by the end of a PhD. Um, and, you know, what in fact happened for me also through that process was that I discovered the limitations of traditional and closed publishing models for books. So the next project that I became interested in uh, was open access book publishing uh, because the publication of my book was my moment of thinking through the fact that this book was going to be 65 pounds in hardback. Uh, it was completely unaffordable to everyone I had interviewed in the course of doing my research. This was not knowledge that I had created about them. It wasn't for them. They couldn't be part of a conversation about the things I was saying. Um, and I also found out, I had no idea until I published a book, that uh, it's usual, it's normal for a couple of hundred copies of that kind of book to be sold. Um, and, and I had a lot of questions about whether that made sense as a dissemination model for research that is, you know, very time and resource intensive and whether that was the kind of uh, scholarship I wanted to be encouraging or part of in the future. Um, so let's fast forward to, hang on, I'll see if I can change my slides, 2021, when our latest book's been released. Uh, and this book, I think, couldn't be more different from the book that I wrote the first time around. Um, it's a book that in contrast to the first book, which I wrote, uh, I didn't write this book, actually. I was part of a community that uh, wrote this book. And I'm not saying that to be modest. I'm saying that because it's true. My role in how this book was made, how it was written, um, was completely different. Um, and I think I'm listed as first name author on this book in part because I played the role of being a kind of producer of a book rather than uh, someone who was locked in a room for several years thinking about, you know, my beautiful sentences and my arc and, you know, whether or not my chapters were nice and evenly spaced. Um, this book was a book that involved, you know, pitching an idea to a university um, around the, the concept of the book sprint, where we were saying, hey, you know, this is something which is being used by other groups, you should give us some funding and let us use this approach to writing uh, in a workshop that we're going to run. And actually uh, taking something which had, had operated really successfully in other knowledge domains and putting it into the context that we wanted to use it for. And then curating a group of authors, thinking about, okay, well, who, what kinds of people would we like to have this conversation with? Who should be in the room when we have this conversation? Um, how are we going to pay for them to all get into the right city so that we're all in one, one place? How are we going to find a location uh, where everyone is locked away. But in Australia, you know, we can find a lot of remote locations, you're never leaving. But finding one of those with internet access um, was actually a real challenge. And so there was a lot of racing around buying uh, portable Wi-Fi hotspots and trying to find, eventually we found a house that was near a mobile phone tower. 
um, in the right kind of remote location and that was fantastic. So we had a location and they could provide us with food because usually you can have internet or a great location or you can have food. You can't have all three and this one had catering as well. Um, so there was a lot of work that went into, you know, putting together an event pitching a concept and then bringing everyone together to start the process of writing. Uh, and the process of writing itself, again, is the complete opposite of the process I went through uh, with my first book. Um, so in this process, once we had, you know, the right people in the room and we had a kind of provocation that we wanted to begin the process with, which was around open knowledge institutions, we kind of had to say, okay, you know, our ownership of the idea is now changing. The whole group is going to own this idea if they think that it's it's an okay idea to take forward and to explore in a book. And then we had to, to be team members. You know, we weren't the bosses of this process. Um, and you know, the work of thinking about how we could bring together people from very different discipline backgrounds, uh, from different countries, uh, and at different stages in their career process was a kind of, you know, production process that happened beforehand. And then there was a lot of trust that went into seeing what came out of the workshop over five days. Um, and just so that you really understand <laughs> <laughs> what a challenge this was for Faith Bosworth and Book Sprints, the, the facilitators of the five-day workshop. Uh, we had sitting in our room someone who was a very recently retired vice-chancellor of a university in London. Uh, he'd retired a, a month or so before and, um, you know, said, all right, I'll come and talk to you about the future of universities. That sounds like a fun project. I'll come along. We had postdocs. <laughs> Uh, we had evolutionary economists and we had, um, you know, one economist who's a, a very serious sinologist and, you know, comes from a very German tradition. We had sociologists from the US and we had people with a science metrics background. Uh, and we, you know, also had librarians in the room. So, so we were all people who were coming at this question of what is a university for? How do we make knowledge? How do we communicate knowledge? And what could that look like in the future from completely different perspectives? Um, and with very different kind of status relationships and expectations going on in the room. Um, so the work that was done by Faith and by Book Sprints, I think was enormously important in uh, getting us to a point where we and didn't just have some kind of agreement or some kind of consensus building process, but we actually had to be productive together. So it wasn't enough to just have a nice conference experience and to share ideas and to talk to each other. We also had to be productive. So, you know, we had to, to a certain, you know, in some ways we were treated like school children and we had some very senior professors who didn't want to uh, keep writing after dinner. They felt that dinner was it. They were tired now. They wanted a glass of wine. That was, you know, that was it for their working day. And the facilitator said, okay, no problem. We won't have to work after dinner. And she moved dinner to nine o'clock in the evening. You know, we had this kind of, you know, tension and, and, you know, how do we ensure that people really are working from first thing in the morning until they fall asleep at night? Because, uh, you know, after five days, we're going to have a book. This isn't, we're not playing. This is going to be a book. And so that was the process. And it was, yeah, it was really different. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about um, this book was that um, in contrast to sort of reporting on a project or writing up research that you then are communicating out, Cameron Nalen and I, um, wanted to set up this book sprint and to have the workshop because we were at the beginning of a project that we knew we had funding for for at least three years at Curtin University that was focused on open knowledge um, and it's called the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. So we had succeeded in securing funding for a, a really great project that we knew would last for at least three years and it might uh, go on for longer if we were successful. And so this um, 
book process for us was an opportunity to start our project, which is sort of research, but also I think we would like to change the world if we have the opportunity, um, with some kind of community input and a framework that we could then apply to the research and the work that we're doing um, with funding that we already knew we had. So this was a kind of validation and manifesto writing for a project that we, you know, intended to go on with. So it was really important from that point of view as well. Um, and at the end of the five days, we, everyone had to get on their planes. It was, there was a lot of pressure. It was pretty interesting, uh, but we had a book um, and it was more or less typeset. It was more or less print ready while we were sleeping during you know at night during the book sprint workshop faith bosworth had been working with a team of uh three other people uh so there was a, a copy editor based in new zealand who was in a different time zone so they were able to work while we were sleeping there was a designer and there was someone who was working on the layout and um you know production of the book so by the end of the book sprint workshop we really had a book <laughs> And there was a little bit of argument that was still happening about uh, Oxford commas and um, referencing styles, which I think was a bit, um, you know, stressful for book sprints because we really did have some pretty hardcore academics on our team who really cared about their referencing style. Um, but we still had a book and we were able to send it to a local printer and get it printed. It was licensed under a Creative Commons license. Uh, and we then had physical copies of an artifact that we could take to senior leadership at our university. Um, we could send to the workshop participants. We could take around when we went to conferences, we could give to people and we could ask them for feedback and for their thoughts on what was essentially um, a, I guess, a really nice preprint because we also had hopes that we would be able to go on and find a publisher for our book. Um, but the other thing that had ha happened by the end of the workshop, which I, again, found really very different from every other experience I've had, uh, was that our book had a digital presence. It already had you know, a, a community conversation that was happening around it. It had some kind of visibility because people were tweeting photos of screens as we were working on mock-ups and looking at design proofs. Uh, they were excited because there were lots of kangaroos hopping around the workshop. And so people wanted to talk about that. And uh, Cameron, you know, tweeted with the core ideas in our book and then book sprints, which I, I hadn't quite been prepared for, also wrote a blog saying, ah, oh, look, it's up, it's published, uh, it's ready, we produced a book, we did it, it took five days and we're really proud of this. And uh, I remember seeing the book sprints tweet with their blog uh, thinking, oh, um, because at the end of the workshop, my job was to go and find a publisher who would um take on the book that was what Cameron and I agreed you know we would do next and so I remember seeing the tweet thinking wow I wonder if a publisher is going to feel comfortable taking a book that is already finished that's already typeset it's already you know obviously it's not really something um, that we're still discussing the length of this is a really a finished book and so I had a bit of an anxiety moment thinking that we might have trouble convincing a publisher that this was something that they should take on for a, for a second round process. Um, but in fact, what happened was the opposite. So Amy Brand from MIT Press uh, was following, she saw our Twitter conversations about the book and she got in contact with us and said, would we consider working with MIT Press um, to explore more open approaches to publishing um, a book and, and we were really up for it. So our book became the first book, as far as I'm aware, to go up on the MIT Press Works in Progress site. They actually created that part of the website to accommodate our book. 
Um, and then we figured out how to send MIT Press the HTML versions of, um, of what Book Sprints had produced. And that was a little bit complicated because Book Sprints had been thinking about how they produce something that's print ready, not how they produce something that can then go into uh, a platform like PubPub. So there were some technical challenges, but it, it wasn't that difficult. And we were then able to have the book up on the MIT Press website as a work in progress and to um, go through a process of community peer review. Uh, and also <laughs> we invited people to, to write, you know, if people would send people a copy of the book and say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, can you, if you have thoughts on this topic, would you be willing to write something up? And and you can see those uh, responses, which sometimes came in as emails or something like that, would then go up on the website as well. Um, so, so that was really good and really interesting. And we were also incredibly fortunate in having a press that was committed to going through a process of traditional formal peer review, which I think has been really important for the book. Um, because it's added an extra layer just of care. I think if anyone, you know, having peer review of books is really something that I think is, you know, to be treasured in part because someone reads the book. So having people paying attention and really thinking carefully about whether or not what you're saying makes sense, I think for us was really helpful. And it took two years to get from the book sprint version to finally uh, a published version. So we started the process in April 2018 and we made it towards, um, you know, this beautiful now print and digital and open access version uh, in 2021, um, which was not a short process. Um, but, you know, the other thing that has, has happened and I think has not always been visible is that while that's been going on, uh, we've also been engaged in a process of community building and thinking about how we can not just have a manifesto for open knowledge institutions that's making an argument for transformation that we want to see in our universities. Uh, we've also been thinking about, okay, well, how would we go about building a kind of coalition of like-minded uh, people that care about uh, this issue also and how could we work with them and create a sense of community around that theme. So there's been a lot of um, work. <laughs> Some of it's been funded by the Arcadia Fund. Um, originally, we'd hoped that that would also involve barbecues and kangaroos or, you know, at least being physically in the same place as other people. Uh, but a lot of it's instead now involved Zoom meetings and online conversations. Um, but that thinking's also had now the opportunity to, to trickle through into the revisions that we made for the final version of the book. So I think that longer time frame for us in the end was actually very helpful and it's allowed for a more open and community engaged process. Um, and I think that's it from me. Um, I think really my only final observation would be that it has for me been an incredibly interesting moment <laughs> to be writing um, and thinking about books, how we make them, how we make knowledge as communities and as scholarly communities often inside universities um, and what the possibilities of collaboration that we have now we have digital technologies and now that we um, perhaps I think are under a little bit more pressure to work in different ways as well as you know, seeing real changes in the way universities function. I think that it's, a, it's an interesting time to be going back and saying, okay, what can we gain from all of this? How can we make the most out of some of the tensions that exist at the boundaries of disciplines, that the boundaries of different ways of working? Um, and, you know, where does, does a different type of writing and knowledge sharing fit in that landscape? So I think that's it. Okay, thanks. Thanks for this uh, wonderful explanation. And um, 
um, uh, many questions uh, come to uh, come to mind. But um, following up on uh, maybe the last thing you've said, so had the book seeing the book as in this case as a community effort, um, moving away from let's say the monolithic single authored um, have four year track PhD book uh, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, a few, a few questions on, on, on let's say, um, had, I, I, ca I can imagine that with the group you ha you've had, with the 13 people, um, had the, the views on uh, the practice itself, um, or, or maybe uh, the move towards openness, so open peer review, but also uh, open access, um, may differ from the start. Um, how did you sort of align the group um, that they are sort of behind the same goal uh, uh, and, and for, for the next? Uh, period to come to write a book. Ah, uh, I or was well, that no issue at all. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about it. No, the so views on open access and peer review weren't an issue. So I, I actually think it's really interesting that we had more arguments about referencing style than okay. about um, the license type. So there was a brief discussion at the beginning. It was a genuine discussion about an open access license. It was completely uncontroversial. Um, and people then, you know, I think proceeded in the spirit of, this is completely new, this is an experiment, this will be fun, what do I have to lose? It's only five days of my life. So I think that for most okay. of the workshop participants, it was just, it was an interesting experiment. Um, but they didn't have to be engaged with the whole process unless they wanted to be. And we've had some uh, authors who have remained really engaged in what we're doing, uh, who still, so I'm having meetings later this evening um, with some of the other authors. And we've had other authors who, so for example, uh, we had the director of the Centre for the Public Communication of Science. She's very in very senior leadership in a university. She could give us five days of her time and attention, but she um, probably doesn't have time to come on a book tour. However, um, you know, she is genuinely willing to think about these ideas and how they apply in her own university and how her university is changing and could change. So there were lots of different levels of engagement, um, but the biggest tensions, yeah, were genuinely, I think, around referencing style. <laughs> <laughs> so go figure. And maybe another, uh, and you already mentioned it also in your talk, uh, 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 authorship, um, uh, with, I guess, uh, and, and it's also part of the, the book itself, uh, so uh, moving to open knowledge institutes means that we need to change evaluation and assessment uh, uh, criteria. Yeah. Um, that's for us, uh, and as you know, uh, and, and luckily I'm at the university, at the university um, I can say that we maybe can consider ourselves already as an open knowledge institute, or at least we want to move to being an open knowledge institute. Uh, but that's not, not, not for all. So um, uh, were there any, so you are basically the organizer, so you are the first author, but with a community approach like this, how, how did that go? And because I can imagine that for others, a, um, let's say a book uh, at a prestigious, prestigious press is still very important. Um, maybe you can say something about those. Yeah, so, aspects. so, um... So I think that everyone in the room for the purpose of evaluation uh, had, a pretty, had a pretty critical perspective on the tools that we often use for evaluation of research. So I don't mm -hmm. think that there was anyone in the room that felt that we really needed to hold on to existing systems of evaluation. And I think that partly that's because of the way we chose this group. So we had people that are very involved in science metrics, they're really acutely aware of the shortcomings of yeah. existing mm -hmm. data sets. We had a vice chancellor who was incredibly critical of the fact that in his view in the UK, vice chancellors can lose their job because they, you know, their university changes ranking position, but there are all so sorts of kinds of value that aren't captured in, you know, rankings that are often really run by media corporations. 
Uh, so I think we had a pretty, an audience that was very receptive to ideas of other ways of, of evaluating the performance of universities. And so, but that was a risk that we were taking when we invited mm -hmm. these people into the room. And at the beginning of the workshop, um, Cameron and I had an idea, you know, that was around this concept of open knowledge institutions. Uh, we thought we kind of had a sense of, of what that would involve, but we were genuinely open to being told, no, that idea is never going to fly. It makes yeah. no mm -hmm. sense. It's, it's really ridiculous. We need to throw it out and come up with a different topic. So there was a risk in that. And actually for us, you know, so far, so good. No one said that it was um, a really silly idea. And by the end of the workshop, everyone had been involved in writing every part of the book. So as a consensus building exercise, even if people didn't really buy into the idea at the beginning, by the end of it, they had, you know, had every opportunity on every day to say, no, we should do this differently. Mm -hmm. um, and they left feeling like they had actually been involved in writing the book, yeah. um, and not just a small piece of the book, if that makes sense. Yeah. So even, even uh, more ritual than um, uh, the sort of structure of co-editors, two or three co-editors and a bunch yeah. of authors that deliver the paper and then um, uh, yeah, so this is more yeah. in, in, in that sense, real collaborative community effort. It sense. really yeah. was. And the yeah. book sprints methodology is very focused on not letting uh, people just write their own section and not take responsibility for other no, sections. It's they, interwoven yeah. in, into the whole, That's the whole right. book. And they, yeah. they, they would move people around and say, no, no, okay, you've done enough on this bit. Now you have to go and work with this other team. You're, you know, here's a new section you've got to look at that. Um, and I think maybe one of the toughest bits for me, so I was involved on the last day of um, kind of trying to edit, you know, that last moment where someone has to kind of stick around until, you know, exactly <laughs> five o'clock when the bus goes. The like, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, this is in, okay, we'll move that around. And actually it was tough making sure that everything stayed in. And I was doing that with a much older and more experienced um, author. And he pulled me back several times and said, no, no, just because you don't like, you know, that particular way of expressing things doesn't mean that you're allowed to just leave that out. That's not what this process is about. So it was really interesting, um, you know, what that, you know, that whole experience for me was very interesting. Yeah. One of my questions was, knowing what you know now, what could you have done differently? Uh, I think, um, well, I mean, it's difficult now because now yeah. I look back and, oh, imagine the luxury of having a book sprint. We had people, you know, that were able to fly in from everywhere. We could all be together for a whole week. I would absolutely, if I had the opportunity, do that again. Um, and I think that's been you know, really brought home to me the privilege of being able to, to get together and to work in an intensive way together in the same physical space has really been highlighted by the fact that, you know, we, you know, the workshop we had last year was three days online over eight time zones. <laughs> and we were trying to facilitate that kind of collaboration and that experience of working together. So I think... Um, I would absolutely do it again. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we'd even change the team. I thought we had a really wonderful team. It was rich. It was interesting. I think we probably, possibly what we would do is um, if we were in a slightly different world, we held a workshop in Mauritius right before COVID in 2019. And our university has a campus in Mauritius. And okay. actually, I we probably would do that because it made it easier for partners from Africa and for us to have more diversity in the room without problems with visas. Um, and I thought that actually, you know, that kind of diversity made it really a super rich experience. So if I get to do it again, if we can do the updated version, it will be from um, another continent, I think. Yeah. Um Looking at the time, and also there are there are a few questions from uh, from uh, the participants. So from from the top, um, Lucy, when did the writing process begin during the sprint? 
was it from day one or did you spend a certain amount of days writing? It was from day one. <laughs> <coughs> and actually, um, yeah, it was really, for me, pretty terrifying because we all sat down at that big table and I thought, oh, you know, normally on the first day of conferences and things, there's a bit of a warm-up time, you get to know mm -hmm. each other. Um, and actually the first exercise that I thought was just a warm-up exercise was, oh, so what, what sections should be in this book? Write it on sticky notes. And then that <laughs> instantly became the book structure. Uh, so it was really, I think, um, you from know. The start. Yeah. Yeah. From the start, there was, you know, it was really a very, not rushed, but there was no sense that, okay, now we relax. It was a really fast-paced experience right from the beginning. Um, another question, uh, who do you think will use uh, the ebook most? Students, scholars, decision makers in education? Um, uh, I guess you, you want them all to read it? <laughs> we would love them all. Uh, well, to and to also tell us what we did wrong. So I think we genuinely, when we wrote the book sprint book, when we set up the workshop, we really have been putting these ideas out almost as questions. So this makes sense to us. Does it make sense to you? So I think we're very interested in a conversation, but um, but we're also interested in change and how we can support change. What are the conditions that we need um, to create if we want to see universities becoming more open, if we want to see the groups that are making knowledge become more diverse if we want to see voices that are heard uh, in our conversations becoming more diverse and moving away from just a privileged uh, few people having a lot of a lot of opinions and a lot of power how do we move towards a different kind of conversation um, so to that extent I really hope that uh, policy makers and decision makers in universities also engage with the ideas yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at the uh, one of the concluding remarks, which is which is basically stating uh, those with the capacity and power must actively and cons continuously work to institutionalize a culture and system in which addressing those issues of uh, uh, openness and, and is seen as valuable and important work. So that that's all of us, right? Um, as me, as a support staff uh, member as well, uh, working on open access policies and open access uh, engagements. Um, a question. Uh, from Bianca, um, did you see a difference in amount or type of community engagement in the various stage of stages of public uh, availability of the book? So in the preprint stage, public commenting on pop up, uh, and now that's out in uh, in this final version. Uh, so. I don't, so actually now I went back to the, the new PubPub because PubPub site, the version that links from the MIT Press uh, site uh, that I showed as my last slide, that mm -hmm. PubPub version isn't the PubPub version that we were working on with all of the comments and the changes visible. Uh, so I had to go back and find the link to the old site and to, to look through the commentary uh, and the engagement. And I was also having a look at the old Twitter conversations to see, well, who was involved in these conversations? Um, and actually, what I noticed is that we had quite a deep level of engagement, but not from, from thousands of people. So, for example, before we had the call from Amy Brand at MIT Press, when I look at those tweets, they've only got maybe six or seven likes. It doesn't look like there's tons mm -hmm. going on. Uh, there's a few retweets. There was a little bit, you know, of, oh, that looks interesting going on. But it didn't just from looking at the Twitter look like, wow, this is really, you know, mm -hmm. reached some important people. But then actually the evidence that we had of the communities that were following that conversation was very different. And the same thing goes for, who was having the conversation in the pub pub version uh, when it was up for comment? We had some people, um, you know, contributing enormous amounts of time to really, really thinking about the ideas in the book, um, and you know, providing us with incredibly useful information. And we had other people that just kind of got involved in comments 
but not so much. But the depth of engagement we got was really interesting. Um, and I personally found the engagement with the physical book really interesting, having the preprint physical version, uh, because so our DVC of research read it, covered his copy in pen marks, like there's pen all over <laughs> his book with comments and have you thought about this? Why haven't you done this? This is missing. This makes no sense to me. Arrows, the works. And then he gave us back the physical copy of his book, um, which I found fascinating because getting for us, trying to get our senior leadership in the university to read more than a bullet point is often impossible right so we have to condense things into one bullet point because that's all they'll read so to see evidence that they were reading and engaging with the entire thing was really quite remarkable for me um and, and, and so, so that would be that is a nice example of post-publication peer review uh, but then in paper um but but one of my questions was so also that was on the, the preprint so that was on the public oh, oh sorry okay that yeah, yeah. okay preprint. no 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 one's oh, touched sorry. One the beautiful MIT Press. Sorry. Uh, you know, imprint. Everyone's been much, you know, more respectful with that. We haven't yet seen anyone put pen on okay. the MIT Press <laughs> on, 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 on this one. <laughs> yeah. But it's but it's um and, and I guess conclude concluding and maybe make a um a relation to the first session and the living book. Um and, and I uh, uh, we've had this discussion with Janneke as well. So uh, um the different stages. Uh, the different outputs uh, at some point. Now you have this version. Um, what will you do with, for instance, uh, post-publication review? And, and uh, are you engaging with, or will it become into a next version? How, uh, is, is that already being discussed or is this something um, you will see how it goes? Well, I would, I mean, it's not yet. I think this year we've just been too <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> but, but I think that I would very much like um, to, yeah, to produce a revised edition. So when we, when we wrote uh, the book, we just had some ideas about what evaluation frameworks could look like. We had ideas about what we could see. We didn't yet have a really deep, collaboration with our Institute for Computation at Curtin, which we now have. There were some perspectives that we really wanted to include, but for example, we wanted someone to come and to provide a perspective on what an open campus could look like. And we wanted someone from architecture and planning or someone from mm -hmm. cities and who was thinking about transport to come and add those perspectives. And we just couldn't find a person. Um, so I think for me, it would be really fantastic to go back and to include additional perspectives, but then also to revisit the chapters on evaluation in light of what we've learned over, well, since 2018 uh, in relation to what we can see, what we can't see, what are the challenges of capturing diversity, where are the weak points, all of those things. Okay. Okay. Um, looking at the time, we're um, out of time. So, um, but I really like this uh, this conversation, and I want to thank you for your uh, honesty, also about uh, uh, the whole the whole process and uh, uh, what it takes to um, uh, to get a, uh, a paper version. Um, uh, so, with that being said, um, thank you very much. Uh, also, the participants, thanks for uh, bringing in questions. Um, and as said, um, we prepare a short written interview also um, um, about this, and uh, we'll publish it on the Open Access Books uh, Network, uh, Humanities Commons website. Um, yeah, so with that being said, have a nice evening, uh, lunch break, uh, or morning. Um, uh, and thank you, Lucy, again for uh, your talk and your uh, presentation. Thanks. Hey, thanks. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.